have that peace of Christ in your hearts and your families. Uh, we need it in our nation and in our church so very, very much at this time. It's a pleasure to be here this evening uh, to be speaking about St. Anthony, one of the great saints of the church. And uh, uh, I have to mention a couple of things. When I was, uh, my mother was born on the Feast of St. Anthony, so she always had a very special love for St. Anthony. And on top of the refrigerator, she had a little statue of St. Anthony surrounded by four candles. I had three brothers, so there was always a candle burning to St. Anthony for myself and my brothers. So I've always had a very special place for St. Anthony in my life. And um, uh, so coming here today to be part of this, I'll be coming actually all three nights. All right, the, the Spanish, uh, the Spanish part will be different priests, different nights. And um, I, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to preach this novena in three nights. It's a, a combination of kind of novena and tree woman. And that is, way back in 1993, I was at the World Youth Day in Denver, Colorado, when Pope John Paul the Great was there, remember? And I was with uh, Father Benedict Rochelle, and we had gone to listen to the Pope in Mile High Stadium in Denver, and it started to rain. And as it started to rain, we all ran, you know, got out of that uh, the stadium and got into cars, and, you know, so we left. But the, what happened is, I realized I had lost my appointment book and my eyeglasses. So uh, I didn't know where they were and I had to find them. So who do you go to? Go to St. Anthony, right? I said, St. Anthony? I said, look, let's, do, let's make a deal. If you find me the appointment book, because all I can think of was all year now, people are going to be calling me and saying, Father Andrew, where are you? And I'll say, where am I supposed to be? Because <laughs> I had everything in the appointment book. So, uh, so I, I said, St. Anthony, I need that appointment book. If you get it back for me, I will preach a tree to him three days in your honor. And if you get my eyeglasses back, I need them too. I said, I'll do another tree to for you. Then I figured, I'm going to sweeten the pie for St. Anthony. I said, if you get both of them back, <laughs> I'll preach a novena for you. So here it is, from 1993, I am finally preaching this novena in honor of St. Anthony. I hope he doesn't charge me, you know, overdue. <laughs> I'd be happy to preach about 20 novenas. Uh, but he is such a wonderful, wonderful saint. And it's a funny little story told about uh, by Pope, with regard to Pope John Paul the Great. He went to Italy, he went to Portugal. Now, you know, St. Anthony was born in Portugal. Okay? And, uh, and there's been a big dispute between the Portuguese and the Italians over St. Anthony. The Italians and most of the world called him St. Anthony of Padua. Portuguese called him St. Anthony of Lisbon because he was born in Lisbon. So when Pope John Paul went to Portugal, he greeted the people and he said, he was talking about St. Anthony, he said, St. Anthony is not St. Anthony of Padua. Well, they all cheered, because they've been saying that for 800 years, you know. Then he said, St. Anthony is not St. Anthony of Lisbon. They were silent. And he said, St. Anthony is St. Anthony of the whole world, and they all cheered. He made them very, very happy. Okay. Well, he certainly is, you know, a very, very popular saint. In fact, of, of uh, the men saints after the time of the apostles, usually you'll find three, you know, competing for the number one spot. St. Anthony, St. Francis, and not Dr. Leo, you know, as, as the most popular uh, saints among the men saints since the time, after the time of the apostles. And, uh, and so St. Anthony was a great preacher. He would preach to 30,000 people at a time. The people would know he was coming, he would send friars ahead of him, and they would come out of their shops and they would come from their farms and everything to hear this great preacher. And uh, he was a great miracle worker. In fact, of all the saints after the time of the apostles, 
he he ran second that we know and the number of miracles but the only one who we know were more miracles than him was saint francis of paola but saint francis of paola was about 90 years old when he died so he was only about 40. so saint anthony was called the wonder worker and uh, uh and so he you know he did you know great things in his life he brought many souls to god he was made a doctor of the church by Pope Pius XII. See, he was born on the Feast of the Assumption. And um, Pope Pius XII was the one in 1950 who declared the dogma of the, of the Assumption of Mary, body and soul, to heaven. So he wanted to be able to quote St. Anthony. So he made him a doctor of the church in 1946. So St. Anthony was a great saint. Okay? Um, <clears throat> What I did, I didn't realize, I thought we were having a Mass tonight, so I took something from the beginning, with the, the first reading of the Mass today. It was about the prophet Elijah. He lived at a time when Israel was going through a very difficult period. See, the king at the time was King Ahab. And the Bible says he did more evil than any king before him. So that's not a very good description of the man. And he married Jezebel. Jezebel? was a Canaanite, she was actually, and she brought the, the religion of the Canaanites, the worship of Baal, you know, to the Holy Land. And that was, de that was deteriorating the faith of the Jewish people, okay? And so there was a great conflict between Ahab and, uh, and Elijah the prophet. And what happened was they went to Mount Carmel. And uh, the Elijah said to the king, Bring all the prophets of Baal, there are 450 of them. And he was the only true prophet of, of Yahweh, he was the God of Israel. And uh, he set up a sacrifice, killed an animal, and he said, he said to all those prophets, well, why don't you invoke your gods to send fire down and consume the sacrifice? Well, they did. They were chanting and everything else and gashing themselves as they did, um, you know, from morning till night. Nothing happened. And finally, around six o'clock, Elijah said to them, Step aside, and you will know that there is a God in Israel. And he invoked God to consume the sacrifice, and the fire came down, consumed the sacrifice, and they destroyed all those prophets of Baal. So Elijah was a man who was a great prophet, he preserved the truth in Israel, and he, you know, uh, in a sense, combating the enemies who were undermining the faith of the people. See, the religion of uh, the offering to Baal involved two things that are immoral. One of them was child sacrifice. They used to offer sacrifices of children to the god Baal. And the second was sodomy, immorality. And, uh, and so um, Elijah defended the true God and the true faith. Okay? Now, the reason I mention this is because St. Anthony, he lived at a time when the church was going through a great trial. There was a movement called the Albigensian Heresy. Albigensian Heresy. It was named the Albigensian Heresy because it, it centered in a city in southern France called Albi. And that was the center of this heresy. In northern, it spread into northern Italy, and then those in Italy called themselves the Cathari. The, the pure ones, okay? And uh, what was this heresy all about? Well, it was a, they, they believed that there were two gods. They believed that there was a good God who created everything spiritual. And everything that was spiritual was good. However, they believed that there was an evil God who created everything that was material. Anything material was evil. Now that's not what God, the true God created. God created everything. Material and spiritual, see? And this heresy spread very rapidly, even among people who were very ardent Catholics. But they were going over to this Albigensian heresy. So what did God do? He raised up two great people to defend the teachings of the church. And one of them was St. Anthony. The other was St. Dominic, okay? Now St. Anthony, you know, he was known for his great miracles. As I said to you, he 
worked with so, so many, many of them. And uh, uh, St. Anthony, you know, uh, again preached against the Albigensians. I forgot to mention some of the things that because they believed that everything material was evil, there were certain heresies they fell into. For example, they didn't believe that in the Incarnation, that God became man because God would not take a human body of flesh that was material. God would not do that. So they denied the Incarnation. As a result of that, they denied that Mary was the mother of God. God would never, again, take flesh from a woman like that. Okay? They also denied the Eucharist. They said that's not the body of Christ. Because God would never unite the body to himself. And uh, they said that marriage was evil because it brought new children into the world. You can see how corrupt they were. And you can see how these teachings were undermining the society of Christian Europe at the time. Okay? So, along comes St. Anthony. Okay? And uh, he was a cat doctor in theology. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but he... Uh, um, he began to preach against them. Remember, he was a man who was very, very loyal to the church. Very, very ardent in his Catholic faith. He loved God immensely. And uh, at the same time, uh, you know, he was concerned about the salvation of souls. See, at the time, there was a council called the Fourth Lateran Council. And the, the Pope at that council spoke to the heads of the different religious orders. St. Francis was there, for example, St. Dominic was there. And um, he said, release your best preachers to preach against the Albigensian. So St. Francis had St. Anthony in the order, so he assigned him to preach against the Albigensians. And he did this both in southern France and in northern Italy. Okay? And, um, and uh, so St. Anthony then, Came very hard into you know you saw that little banner out there of St. Anthony, you know, he has fire in his hand. His heart was on fire with the love of God. Mm -hmm. And so he preached the Cathari. Those were the that was the, uh, the pure ones there in northern Italy. And you know, on one occasion, and he had great success, but on one occasion they didn't want to hear him. He was along the seacoast, and uh, the, they were fishermen. And they, they didn't want to hear him preach. They said, well, why don't you preach to the fish? So you know what he did? He turned around and began to preach over the water. They said by the hundreds, the fish were bobbling out of the water to listen to this thing. Great miracle you know, that God performed, you know, and the, it, it converted a lot of the people. These dumb animals could listen to this great. So God worked that a, a great miracle there to help the people. Uh, on another occasion when he was in southern France, he was preaching about the Eucharist. As I told you, they denied the Eucharist. They denied it to the body of Christ. You know? So a, a farmer challenged him. He said, I'll bring my donkey to the square. Draw over, you, know, you bring your Eucharist to the square. I'll bring my donkey and I'll bring a pile of oats. And I'll let my donkey go free. If he goes to the oats, I won't believe in the Eucharist. If he goes to the Eucharist, I'll believe in it. And so St. Anthony prayed. And the farmer, you know, he, he uh, starved that poor donkey for a couple of days there. And uh, the square was filled with people. They wanted to see what was going to happen. So St. Anthony came holding the Blessed Sacrament, like right, the monstrance, on one end of the square. The donkey, the oats was at the other end. The farmer let the, the donkey go. He took a couple of steps toward the oats. And then he turned and went right to the Blessed Sacrament and even bowed. And so again, God used animals, dumb animals, to, you know, affect the minds and hearts of these people. Their hearts have been hardened. But through the power of St. Anthony's prayers and his great miracles, many of them were converted back to the Okay. So St. Anthony, you know, did a great deal. Um, in fact, he brought so many heretics back that they nicknamed him the Hammer of the Heretics. In other words, the one who was really giving them a hard time. The other one who did so much for the 
the Albigensians, we should mention him, was St. Dominic. Dominic, the founder of the Dominican Order. And uh, it is believed that our Blessed Lady appeared to him with the rosary and said to preach the rosary to the people to stop this heresy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he did, remember? And um, he had, it was a great spiritual weapon, the rosary. And what happened was there was a great battle between the, the Catholics, the Crusaders, and these Albigensians. They had an army of 20,000 men. There were only 800 Catholic soldiers. Uh, but the night before the battle, the Albigensian army, they were drinking, getting drunk, they were involved in moral activity and everything. Um, the Christian soldiers, on the other hand, prayed the rosary all night. And uh, in the morning, they went to confession, they received Holy Communion. Only 800 of them against 20,000 Albigensians. The battle lasted less than 20 minutes. The Christian soldiers devastated the Albigensian army, and that stopped the spread of the Albigensian heresy in Europe. It's called the Battle of Moret in September of 12 to 13. So St. Anthony had a great deal to, you know, to uh, uh, play in this great opposition to the heresy. Again, it was threatening the very culture, the very society of Europe, which was a Christian society. And you know, I, I mentioned these two great saints and uh, you know, what happened in this battle and what was happening with this heresy. Because brothers and sisters, you know, we have to realize what's happening in our own time, okay? I don't know how much you are aware of what's going on in our world and in our country in a very special way. I don't know if you know, you realize what's actually happening here. Okay? Um, just as that heresy was threatening the very existence of you know, Christian Europe, um, our country is changing so much. And uh, let me read to you what Pope John Paul said in 1976. He was not the Holy Father yet. Right? But this is what he said. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. That's a statement, isn't it? How the greatest spiritual struggle that we've ever seen in the whole human race. It's history. I do not think the wide circle of the American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the Antichrist. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan that it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. He spoke that in 1976. He had come to the United States when we were celebrating 200 years as a nation uh, in Philadelphia. He was there and he stayed, he stayed in that. Okay. And brothers and sisters, we are in a great spiritual confrontation. People don't see it. No. Um, but what's happening, you know, is um, again, the Pope had warned us. This goes back, I even very devoted to our Lady of Fatima. We keep preaching Fatima all over. I see Fatima as our greatest hope at this time. Okay? Um, the, the Blessed Mother, and, you know, we're celebrating next year, 100th anniversary of her coming. In her July apparition in 1917, she said this, among other things, she said, the war, World War I, would end. She said, and if people observe what I say, you know, there will be peace if not another more terrible war would come. She even mentioned the Pope that it would happen under, she said, Pius XI. He wasn't the Pope at the time. Benedict XV was the Pope. And then, and then she, she said that uh, if you see a night lit up by an unknown light, know that that is a sign that God will punish the world for its sins. That happened on the night of January 25th to 26th, 
26, 1938. It was an unusual light. They don't know where it came, what it, what it caused it. I received an article recently from someone who said scientists are trying to study what that light was that night. But Sister Lucia, who was alive, she said, that's the sign that God would punish the world for its sins by a war. And that was World War II. But then she added, God, she said, an evil would begin in Russia that will spread her areas around the world, provoking wars with Korea, with Vietnam, uh, causing famine. Remember how Stalin starved the Ukrainians? Uh, persecution of the church. The Pope will have much to suffer. Many nations will be annihilated. They became part of the Soviet Union. They lost their own freedom. And she predicted all of this. She said, I will come back and ask for two things. I will ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart by the Pope and the bishops. And I will ask for the five first Saturdays devotion, which consists of five consecutive first Saturdays. You go to the confession, night or any day during the month, as long as you have the intention to make it part of your five, five Saturday devotion. Secondly, receive Holy Communion on those first Saturdays. Pray one rosary to five decades, and then spend 15 minutes keeping Our Lady company, meditating on the other mysteries of the, of the vision, all to make reparation for the offenses against her Immaculate Heart. Those who blaspheme her Immaculate Conception, those who blaspheme her uh, perpetual virginity, those who blaspheme her as Mother of God, our Mother, those who keep the young from her, and finally, those who desecrate her images. Those are the reparations for that devotion. Now, what happened, you know, is we did see the spread of communism. Finally, in 1984, on March 25th, Pope John Paul the Great made the consecration that Our Lady requested. That's done. The Pope did his part, and you could see the effect of it in Russia. Religion is increasing enormously in Russia. Okay? They're the ones who are exporting the atheism, you know, and everything else that communism exported. But they are having a great religious revival. And, um, and, and so the consecration, as Sister Lucia said, heaven accepted it. Okay? So don't believe the people who keep telling you it wasn't enough. She said, she's the only one who can say it. Heaven accepted it. I heard people say she was told to lie. No. You know, I looked at East Lebanon Bronx used to say, give me a break. <laughs> you know what I mean? Give me a break. You think that John Paul the Great is going to tell somebody to lie, and he's going to tell a nun who saw the Blessed Mother six times to lie, and you think that that nun, who at the age of 10 was willing to be boiled in oil because she refused to release the secrets that our lady told her to keep secret, you know, she was threatened to be boiled in oil, and you think she knowing she's the only person on the whole earth who could tell us whether the consecration was accepted or not is going to lie? How do you have any mind to do that? Even the Pope can't tell you to lie. Why did you sin? And that saint was not going to sin. She said, I have been accepted. I believe it. I believe the Pope when he said, I made it. I made the consecration. Okay, where does that bring us now? This is what I want to point out to you. At the Synod on the Family last year, two years ago, there was a Romanian woman there, Simon, she was a doctor. She made an interesting distinction which I had never seen put that way. She said, we no longer have the classical form of Marxism, where they send in an army or the government. Cornerstone, 
any Christian culture. It's the sacredness of all life, from conception to natural death. And that's been undermined, hasn't it? Abortion. Remember I told you that the Baal, you know, the religion, which is really satanic, uh, one of the things they did was sacrifice children. We have a lot of demand in the country. In fact, I remember a couple, about a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, they announced on the radio we have 200,000 more witches in the United States now than about five years ago. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> the light has come on. <laughs> Say that to you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, the satanic is widespread in this country. Okay? The attack on life. Abortion. Euthanasia. Assisted suicide. Embryonic stem cell research. All of those are attacks on life. What's the second part? Christian culture is to respect for your gender. The Bible says God made them man and female. We don't have 17 genders. This is part of this, this, uh, this is part of this cultural Marxism. Do you know they had genderism in Russia under Lenin? He's the one who stopped it, not because of religious reasons. He saw it as destroying Russia. We got it now. Is there a lot of craziness going on? I mean, to, to think you got 17 different genders. I admire that governor in North Carolina who said, what's on your birth certificate, that's what you are. Hmm? I mean, I, I really told him, listen, I'm afraid to go to the bathroom. So a man's going to walk in there. You know, the, the Romans had a saying before the fall of Rome. It said, those who the gods were intent on destroying when they first turned mad. I wonder if we're reaching that level. We're going mad. It's just crazy. But it's undermining our Christian culture. Third, what's the third part of Christian culture? Marriage and the family. Gay marriages, people living together, and so on. The family being undermined. That's the basic building block of any society is the family. As the family goes, the society goes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know how many of you know of a man named Ralph Martin. Ralph Martin was involved with the first charismatic experience in Duquesne University back in 1967. And um, he recently released in his newsletter two quotes from a letter the sister she had secretly written to a cardinal. She, he had the cardinal had written to him she wrote back, and no one knew about this letter, but the, the letter has now been revealed. And he mentioned two things she mentioned in that letter. Number one, she said, the last battle between Christ and Satan will be over marriage and the family. To me, that means we're in the tenth round of the ten round. And somebody's going to get knocked out, and that won't be Jesus. That's why I believe this message of Adam is so important for our time. It's the only thing I see that gives us hope in this struggle because Mary predicted this was going to happen. She said the evil of communism will spread. And now there's one last thing. No, the second thing he said, by the way, he said Mary has already crushed the head of the serpent. And the only thing that could be was when um, Pope John Paul made the consequences. And so there's one final part of our Christian culture, and that is our religious freedom. And that's gradually being taken from us. That case they just decided, thank God, the Supreme Court didn't make a decision to go back to the lower courts. But the poor little sisters in the morning. Because you bet you pay, pay all those fines, they have to close all their places. Big companies like Pepsi Cola, I think it was, they're not being, they're not paying that. You know, it seems so much is aimed at the Catholic Church. They got another thing coming out now. It's going to be coming out. I heard it on a reading. That every hospital must have a place for sex gender changes and abortions and everything else. I mean, where is our freedom? Where is 
in our religious We need a St. Anthony, don't we? We need another St. Dominic. We need the rosary. What was our lady's plan? I'll tell you what the plan is for that. You know what we have to do. Pray the rosary every day. The only thing our lady mentioned in all six of her apparitions at Fatima to the children, she said, tell the people to pray the rosary every day. She said, the rosary is powerful enough to stop wars, bring world peace, convert sinners. Pray the rosary, please. I don't know if you heard the story about nine months ago now. It happened in Nigeria, in a country, a diocese that was being overrun by Boko Haram, ISIS. And the bishop there, he went to the chapel to pray. And as he was praying, Christ appeared to him. Christ had a sword. He gave the sword to the bishop. And when the bishop took the sword in his hand, guess what happened? It turned into a rosary. And Jesus said to him, that's the weapon against Boko Haram. That's our weapon against this evil of this cultural Marxism. You know? So pray the rosary. Please, every day. Do the five first Saturday. I didn't bring my books here tonight. Maybe I'll bring it tomorrow night. I forgot to bring them. Okay, but I have some books on that. You know, Pope Leo, Pope uh, Benedict, you know, the 15th said, be an apostle of Mary, learn the message of Fatima, live the message of Fatima, and spread the message of Fatima. Okay? Um, you know, our lady said, anyone who spreads her message, she said, I will arrange them like flowers around the throne of God. Now, if you don't want a nosebleed section in heaven, <laughs> please help her promote her message, and you'll be right near Jesus. Because the mother of God will make sure you get there. Okay? And so pray. Pray that for those of you, like St. Anthony and St. Dominic, we have our challenge. You know, it struck me today as I was putting these notes together. I didn't realize before I started putting this talk together that St. Anthony was living in a time similar to our own. His society was in danger of being undermined by the false teachings of the, of the uh, Albigensians. Again, that God did not become man, that the marriage was evil to bring a, a, a new child into the was in you. It's everything we've got now, isn't it? We're hearing that. All these kinds of things. So let us pray. Don't be afraid. Mary, we know what she's going to win this battle. She said, when enough people do, as I have said, my triumph will come. And that will bring peace to the world. You have a sheet with the prayers here for the day seven.